Hey guys, welcome back. My name is Michael McCarville and this is Fun with Fallen Flags episode 64. Uh, we're going to do part 6 of this Vance Junction series and we're going to do the section house. Big picture there on the lower left, that's the section house. Looks like a depot, I know, but the depot is actually the passenger car. If you look at the little picture on the top, that passenger car on the right side, that's actually sitting on the ground and that's the depot and the telegraph office. So this is in the... Um, in Colorado along the Rio Grande Southern Main Line. So Vance Junction was where the main line continued north and south, but one spur broke off and went off to the east to uh, Telluride, Colorado. A bunch of mines and things up there. So that's the reason for the junction. So uh, this is an HO scale project. We're going to build the section house in HO. This is a kit from Banta Model Works and I want to thank Bill Banta for giving me some additional information as I was going through. Hopefully it'll save you maybe a step or two if you're building it or just clarify something in the rules or in the instructions. Um, hopefully that uh, uh, maybe I, you can save a step where <laughs> I didn't have that luxury. Um, also the uh, friends of the Cumberson Toltec have been super helpful and uh, giving me the ability to feature uh, some photos. So these two photos you can find on their website uh, used with their permission. So thanks guys, I appreciate it. If you guys haven't uh, been able to check out that website, um, check them out. I'm going to leave the Bantam Model Works, the uh, Fun with Fallen Flags uh, YouTube channel, the uh, Facebook group that this is also part of for HO Scale Tutorials and the uh, Friends of Cumbrous and Toltec. Um, all that stuff, I'm going to put all that stuff in the notes below, so if you're looking for any of that stuff, or you just want to jump ahead and go look over there, uh, check out the notes. Um, let's see what else. Uh, also, if you are interested in new releases for this stuff, uh, go to the uh, YouTube channel and click on the bell icon. That way you'll get a notification that you uh, have new content that you can view. Um, I want to thank you guys for uh, supporting the channel and supporting uh, me and my efforts. Uh, it does mean a lot to me, um, but I also want to apologize for the delay. <laughs> it was quite a long delay, a couple of weeks, several weeks. So uh, I'm back on track. And matter of fact, I've got some kits lined up that uh, I was able to get my hands on. So um, apologize. And uh, I also, also want to uh, send a thank you out for those who have reached out to me and were interested in having me either work on a project for them or able to provide me with historical uh, reference material. Uh, that is always very helpful. Love historical uh, material. So anyway, let's get to business. We'll stop talking about this. Um, so this is the section house. Like I said, this is where the agent uh, lives on top and the uh, crew quarters is are on the bottom so the section crews would live uh, downstairs. This is not the depot, the depot is next to it, it's that passenger building that has a telegraph office in it too. So I know it seems kind of reversed but um, so be it. Um, we're modeling it, the picture you see here is in the uh, I think late 40s, early 50s. This uh, depot wasn't really getting painted at that point and you can start to see some separation in the uh, little bit of shingle wear and uh, the siding boards are starting to wear a little bit. Some of them have some pretty good gaps in them. Uh, so I'm going a little earlier when the structure was maybe maintained just a little bit better. Um, so aiming for probably the uh, mid to late 30s or very very early 40s. So not in the 1950s, mid 1950s that you see a lot of the uh, Colorado rail fanning uh, video from. So uh, let's see what else. Uh, it's important that we go through this kit in a certain order because there are lots of different layers to the windows and the siding and the base structure uh, and painting it is kind of a consideration as you go. You don't want to have to go and repaint and retouch up all the time. So um, although it is a laser built kit, uh, you kind of think through the process as you go. Um, 
This is a standalone kit from Phantom Model Works. Uh, I believe there's some other earlier versions of the this kit out there from other manufacturers. However, uh, this looked like the newest uh, kit that I could find and the one that's still available at, at this point in um, November of 2019. So anyway, um, there are some outbuildings that all come in one kit and then there's the section house. So there's two different kits that are associated with it and it gives you the uh, section house plus the other four buildings that are in the outbuildings kit. So we're going to do this, then we're going to go to the depot, the little passenger uh, structure that's sitting on the ground, and then um, after that we'll take a look at some other special projects. We're going to do Ophir, Ophir, Colorado next, the Ophir Loop the bridge and all the buildings and stuff around there too. Um, and then I've got a few other uh, structures that I want to build as well. I've got some uh, Dallas uh, divide stuff. So anyway, getting way ahead of myself. Cracking open the box, there is a lot of panels in here of uh, pieces. So uh, the essential main structure is the dollhouse looking pieces right in the center. You can see the actual shape of the uh, structure itself. There is the, uh, what is it, one, two, three, four, five pieces. So that's what we're going to build the structure out of. Once we get that thing together, uh, there's going to be a box underneath it, and that's going to be the basement. And then uh, all the pieces get applied on the outside of that. So we want to go build a really square, nice, solid structure. So let's just go through some of these parts real quick. So like I said, that's the middle stuff. The stuff under, underneath those uh, pieces is actually the basement. Upper left hand corner, there are a lot of sheets of uh, strip shingles and they're going to be used for not only the uh, shingles on top of the roof, but there's some siding areas where they're going to be shingled as well. So we're going to use those. Um, some of the other panels in the upper right, those are just the uh, the eaves and the, the um, the attic pieces uh, where that have the upstairs windows. Uh, lower right, those are just additional layers for the same thing. Uh, my kit came with two pieces of the window material, the, uh, the, the, the frames that all get sandwiched together. So if your kit has two, then maybe that's standard, but I don't know if maybe they stuck two in mine and didn't realize it, but I got two sheets. So one sheet is enough to do the building. So you don't really need the second sheet. So, and then there's two little castings there in the very small center, the grayish looking pieces. Those are the chimneys. Those are uh, uh, soft metal castings. Uh, those are going to go in. Um, and just a note, they do tell you to cut the holes in the roof panels for those. I waited. I didn't do that when they told me to. Big mistake. Do as they tell you. Um, there's a reason why it's in there at a certain point. It's the easiest way to do it. I I didn't cut mine until the structure was together, the roof was on, the shingles were on, and it was essentially painted. And then I had to very tenderly uh, make perfectly square holes. Well, if you do it when you're putting the shingles on, the, uh, the, the panels actually get shingled uh, laying flat separately and then you put them on and then you can put a cap on the top so yeah not a good plan <laughs> so do what they say in these instructions don't do as I did um, other than that that's about it the uh, the piece that uh, in the that's laying on top of the instructions it's kind of a rectangular piece it has a whole bunch of little um, stairs and steps and things like that on it uh, that's what you use to build the deck that goes around the back of the structure. And um, mine was out of material that was a little thicker than I think what they intended. So it didn't really fit in the um, in the uh, stairway jig. And But for it really wasn't a problem. I just didn't use the stairway jig. I just built it separately and I built um, um, the deck that runs around the back of it, uh, you know, just by modifying uh, some of my process a little bit. So um, I don't know if yours comes with a little bit thicker material. If it does, 
it's not really a big deal. I built it anyway and it looks fine. Um, but just kind of note that if it, your, your stairway risers don't fit into the little slots of the jig, then you're having the same issue that I did. Uh, maybe they fix that in a newer version of the kit. I don't know. Um, just a heads up on that. Um, we do a lot of similar stuff on this kit that we did in the earlier kits. And um, I used Starbrand paints for uh, Rio Grande Southern Depot Buff, STR07 for the wood sides. Um, I went to a craft store and got a uh, some red oxide paint for the very bottom of it, uh, the, the basement section. Uh, the Denver Rio Grande Western trim is also a star paint. That's actually a PBL. You can go find it on the PBL website. Uh, Denver Rio Grande Western trim brown for trim work. Um, and then I didn't brush paint this. I used a airbrush on all of this. I have an Iwata uh, airbrush that I use for the uh, Depot buff siding. And then I sprayed a bunch of the sheets like the windows and the trim pieces and things like that. I just laid all the sheets out and then just airbrushed the brown onto it. And uh, f first of all, it's easier. Second of all, you use a lot less paint. Um, and I guess third, it looks a lot better too because the ca the coat is very uniform, so it looks good. Um, other than that, uh, some chalk powders and uh, dull coat in between uh, layers of that. And I also use a India ink and isopropyl alcohol uh, 10 to 1 mixture, uh, 10 parts of alcohol to one part India ink. And I use that for the uh, some of the washes and aging things and, and like the wood on the deck. I didn't I didn't do anything with it, stain it or anything. I just gave it an India ink wash because I wanted it just to look like it was kind of that graying wood look. And that does a really good job of that. And also uh, any ink wash looks good on the uh, roof, brings a little tone into it. But anyway, we'll get into some of that. So um, paint washes, chalk powders, airbrush. Um, that's what we have to go with uh, ahead. So let's go ahead and go through some of the steps once we get the uh, some of these parts cut out. Okay, so the first step that you're going to do is you're going to take the uh, sidewalls and the uh, floor and then the four basement walls and those are the inner walls they're called. You're going to grab all those parts, glue them together. Now I use um, Titebond 3 uh, glue because I've tried a couple different wood glues. The thing I like about Titebond is not only is it really strong even on painted surfaces but um, it's waterproof. So I don't have to worry later on about it getting saturated if I'm doing any kind of ground foam or you know gravel around it and saturating it. So um, I do like that part of it. Um, it's also really strong. So it's a construction grade adhesive. So um, it's what I use. Everybody has their own preference. As soon as you get on the subject of glues, everybody has their own, you know, ah, one's the best. So. Use what you like. Use what's good. That's what I use. Uh, it seems to work really well. And um, on the corners, you can kind of see it. Um, I reinforce it. I put a little uh, bead of glue up all the joints. So mine can sustain a little bit of damage. Or uh, um, if I were to try to remove it from uh, a piece of scenery uh, later on, if I decided I wanted to use it someplace else, um, it's going to hold together really well. So. Um, also, speaking of which, this is actually the kit that's finished. Jumping ahead, here's the sneak preview. <laughs> um, I'll give you guys a once around, you can see what it looks like. You'll notice that there are two doors way up high. This is the track level. This is the wood side. This is the basement exposed walkout down here. And then there's a little piece of panel of brick, and we'll get to that. So the train, the ground line, would be up here on the track level, taper down here, and then it's flat here. A little door, little door in the back. 
and then stairs. And then I put these posts all the way to the ground just because when I put it this on the scenery, it's gonna these posts are gonna go into little holes that I drive into the uh, the scenery with um, a knife or a, a little drill or something. So this will actually go down into it. It'll probably still get glued and anchored in place, but um, I, that way I don't have to make a decision right now on how tall these little posts are. But we'll get to all that. So um, anyway. When you are putting in the uh, floor, if you're thinking about doing lighting later, even if you're not thinking about doing lighting later, cut a, <laughs> cut a hole in here. Uh, if you ever have any problems getting into the structure or you happen to be putting the uh, chimney on and uh, for some reason it falls through or whatever, uh, you've got that access place. Uh, there's an interior wall here and you don't see it in the picture on the left. But this interior wall um, splits the structure right about here. So there's a, another cavity here. And you can put lighting in here, but you don't necessarily have to expose the entire underside of it if you don't want to. So I just did this just so I could get in the bottom of it. I thought maybe someday I'll put lighting in it. Um, who knows? That's a someday project. That goes on the someday list. All right, so let's start getting into the construction. But uh, once you have these four pieces, um, on the on the the base, the floor, and you can see that it's all tabbed, so it goes together really well. Um, make it nice and solid. Spend a little extra time making sure it's perfectly square when you do it, because otherwise you're just going to have problems with lining up the panels on top. Uh, so um, this whole structure gets covered in siding material, brick material, whatever. Um, so get this right, and then you'll have a solid foundation to build on. So let's go on to our next step. Okay, so let's talk about the outside pieces, the the uh, outer walls, they're called. Um, find the right side I'm looking at. Okay, so you'll notice that it's got this red oxide color. This is this uh, board and batten material that gets placed over the outside. So it gives it a board and batten look. And then they're a little long, so you end up having to trim these. That's that's by design. But on this piece, so that's the board and batten. This piece right here is a, um, it's actually laser cut onto the foundation piece in a brick structure. Uh, so what you're going to do is you're going to end up painting it a brick color. Then you're going to... Uh, Add a little bit of mortar color inside it, and then uh, whether it is you would normally uh, any brick structure. So you can see what I have here in the photo. You can see the board and batten on the left with a little bit of the red oxide scraped off just to show a little bit of wear. So I weathered it that way on the board and batten, this red oxide material. But the brick, that's actually that's actually basswood. That's not plastic, and it's not plaster or anything like that. That's actually basswood etched. So when you're painting it and you're uh, weathering it and applying uh, mortar, you want to be really careful because it's really easy to do a couple things. Number one, overspray it onto the other panel. And number two, it's wood underneath. So if you saturate it too much, it's going to start to peel off. Uh, you just want to be really careful with it. Uh, go really light at this phase on that brick. If you really wanted to, you could just put some other brick material over that panel com and completely abandon the laser cut, but I mean, that's up to you. To me, it was easier to use the, <laughs> the etched basswood that was already there, so. Okay, and then this is just a shot of what the board and batten uh, looks like. Now, uh, one of the things I did, since there's going to be wood grain underneath this, and I didn't necessarily want to see big wood grain underneath it, I did kind of coat it a little bit with a little bit of uh, diluted glue and water really lightly just to soak up some, into some of those cracks. And then I put the material on so that way it didn't look like it was, you know, like uh, weathered wood or the grain was showing through really well. I didn't really want to see that. 
Um, so what you see here is kind of a coated under uh, side of it, and then the board and batten adhesive is stuck onto the top. And like I said earlier, uh, they do hang down a little bit below the foundation. Uh, you just need to lay it on a, a flat surface um, after it's already on, and then just trim along the bottom. Bottom's probably going to get covered up by some ground terrain anyway, so it's probably not a big deal. But anyway, sort of simple step, but I just wanted to mention uh, one of the extra steps I took. Okay, I like this picture. I hope you don't think I'm being too silly, but <laughs> I really like this picture. Um, the outside, I used a uh, Liquitex Professional Heavy Body Acrylic. It's kind of a thick uh, paint. Um, I used this. It's a red oxide color. Red oxide is what I came up with after painting the uh, foundation section that wasn't going to be seen with all these different kinds of colors because I couldn't find one that matched uh, a couple of the color photos that I found on the uh, Friends and Cumbrous and Toltec site. So what I ended up with is this paint that I got at one of the craft stores nearby. I'm sure it's pretty easy to find. And red oxide is a pretty standard color too. So, um, But you can see on here that I've got pinks and reds and rust and brownish color and all kinds of stuff and nothing I could find looked like what it was described as and it was described as red oxide well go get what it's described as go to the store buy the thing called red oxide worked great um, you can find some color photos very few and they're hard to see and every single color that you see the uh, the structure is different because depending on the angle the reflection the amount of sunlight uh, what kind of day it was uh, all of that affects the color that you see also, as you notice, um, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but if you paint a, uh, let's say you paint a tank uh, in, you know, a military armor tank and you paint it in a certain color of green, you use a different shade of green as the scale goes up and down too. So, um, because otherwise a dark green on a large scale will look normal. On a very small, it'll look very dark. So you want a little bit of contrast and Anyway, I'm getting off subject. So that's the color that it came out to be. And uh, again, like, you know, the the uh, the angle looks pretty dark there. You know, if I get a little reflection from the ceiling lights and the lamp that I have sitting over here, you know, I mean, the, the color changes. So every picture is different. So I chose what I think is a pretty good representation. So... You know, I set it down, it looks completely different than when I was just holding it up. So anyway, no more silliness. I uh, I just wanted to show that if you're not sure of the color, put a bunch of colors on a, a section that you're never going to see. And uh, by the way, all of this got hidden because I painted the whole front of it a uh, uniform color anyway. So, uh, um, and you can see little notes that I have written on there, what kind of uh, shade it was, what brand of paint it was, if it was a tester's paint or whatever. So anyway, just a tip on something you might want to try. Okay, so we got the outside wall. Um, we're starting to add the panels to it. And some of the outside panels are just regular siding pieces. So they're pretty straightforward. Uh, some of the outside panels, like the attic pieces on the top, the little triangu triangular pieces like you can see here where the two windows go or one window go goes uh, those are actually shingled and um, the material that you are given in the kit uh, I actually got quite a few pieces of that shingle material so I don't know if that's normal but I mean there was a lot in there um, I think I probably used about half maybe more but um, just the fact that you know there's plenty of material in there if you screw up you can just put another layer down on it uh, they recommend using a spray adhesive and uh, I went with what I had which was um, a uh, thinned uh, glue a thinned white glue and um, actually you know what I take it back I didn't even use thinned white glue I used the uh, tight bond glue again and I just used a very small thin bead of it across there because these these uh, shingle pieces are not very big. They're maybe 
I don't know, they're bigger than a sixteenth, maybe an eighth of an inch wide. Um, and then you can see there's lines on here, and those are actually for aligning the shingle pieces. So you can align it on the triangles, which is actually really slick. So anyway, uh, we're going to put shingles on all these uh, upper side pieces, these triangular pieces. And then once all that's done, and there is a lot of them, and then um, there's a, what? What is there? One, two, three, four, five. So there's a total of five of these pieces that get this shingle treatment. And just when you're done with this and you go, oh, okay, done, one strip at a time, th then <laughs> at that point it sinks in. And you're like, I haven't even started the roof yet. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, just take your time and you'll get through it, but it is definitely time consuming. Okay, so once you get all the shingling done on the sides, on the five pieces, did I say four pieces or five pieces? So there's five pieces for the upstairs, and then the bottom floors are, uh, there's uh, the four walls that go around the outside on the, the bottom floor. Um, once you get all the shingling done, and it's all trimmed up and nice and neat, and then you get the uh, the bottom sections. You don't really have to do it's laser cut, so you really don't have to do any uh, cleanup of the laser. Um, if you want to, you can go and look at some photos and maybe replicate where some of the wear is. But I tried to mirror something that I thought was just a couple of places that I might have gone in and modified the little cracks in the siding. Um, but generally, I didn't do much. Um, because I wanted it not to look as old. I also wanted it to contrast with the other structures that it was sitting next to. So the two uh, old boxcar and RPO baggage that it sits next to, that are to the left of it in that top picture, I want those to look very neglected and this to look not quite as much. So I took a little liberty with that, but um, you know, do what you like. Um, when you get all these pieces ready to go, lay them out, get your airbrush out, use the paint that you like. And again, this is a lot like picking the oxide. I mean, you know, we hunted all over the place for oxide red to get the right color. Uh, you can do the same thing with this. However, I use the star brand paint because I've already painted a couple of structures with this color. So I did want it to match somewhat, but I didn't tone it down and, and dilute it and, and, you know, add any white to it because I wanted it to look a little more fresh than the other structures. The other structures definitely look a lot more worn uh, sitting next to these, which I, I do like that. Um, so anyway, airbrush these. I know sometimes you hear that if you're going to airbrush uh, you know, something, you're going to uh, want to paint the back side of it so it doesn't warp. Well, if you don't use a heavy coat and this material is fairly thick, you don't really have to worry about that. So I didn't have any problems at all. I didn't paint the backsides at all. They're still completely barren. You can see right here, the inside, everything's completely bare wood, including here and the sides and everything else. So I didn't, I didn't worry about that. Um, but again, I was doing very light coats and I would come back and paint it three times. He's probably got a total of three coats, but the first coat wasn't a complete cover because I wanted to just give it a light coat with my uh, airbrush. So anyway, paint it, get a good solid coat on it, keep a little bit of the paint that you've had mixed up because inevitably you're probably going to ding something or scratch something. You're, we still got a lot of windows and doors to put on. We got a lot of trim pieces to put on. So uh, keep a little bit of that mixed paint left over and then you can use that for touch up. Something, and I haven't done this on this kit, but I, I have done on a bunch of kits is and I'll probably go back and do this now that I'm reminding myself of it. But um, a lot of times I'll write in here the paints that I used, what what colors. I mean, I have it in notes and stuff for the video that I'll, I'll put in the notes. Um, but, you know, you can write it in here, too, as a reference. It's not going to help you once you mount it to the, to the layout. But eh. anyway, it sounded like good advice. All right, moving on. Okay, so at this point, the walls are all painted, and we're starting to build up the windows and doors. Now, the windows and doors essentially are a flat piece of material 
with on top of it goes a, a, a sandwich to layer of either a window pane or a uh, door frame that goes over the top and it may have actually multiple layers of it to build up that 3D texture. So depending on what kind of door or window it is. The smaller windows are going to be very simple. Um, also the uh, the windows um, are actually multiple layers. So there's a there's a, a window frame that goes around. Then there's a uh, a, a frame that goes around the entire uh, bottom, the top, and has the bottom pane in it, and then there's another layer that goes in, and is the top layer. Um, so anyway, what I'm trying to say, badly, <laughs> is um, you're going to have several different layers to build up uh, the doors and windows. Also, the triangular pieces that go around here, uh, you're going to have those built up and then when you get all that done, there is a little piece of windowsill at the bottom of this too. And you put that in there. And all this is adhesive backed. So if you just paint the top, make sure you get, when you paint it, make sure you get this, this, the sides of the adhesive material and then the top. And then you can peel the paper off the back and then you can just start sandwiching stuff onto it. On the back side of that, goes the glass pane material and uh, make sure it's nice and clean. You don't have any fingerprints on it. Uh, I hate seeing fingerprints on the glass on the inside of the building after I've already put the walls together. After all the doors are assembled, painted and assembled, and the windows are all painted and assembled, you can start putting them into the structure and putting the glass on the back side. That's actually kind of, that. that's the part I enjoy the most because you're really starting to see the structure take shape. Um, and then you can get some either uh, cardstock or white paper or go crazy and get some sort of curtain material or printouts and put behind the windows. But a lot of the pictures that you see of the structure, you see it with what looks like shades pulled down. So I used a piece of uh, parchment paper that type of color, it kind of gives it a yellowed off white looking um, material. So I use that for the parchment, or for, I'm sorry, for the blinds, it gives it that sort of uh, yellowish parchment color. And the material you see here that's laying uh, underneath each of the walls is that, and I cut some of, most of them I have the shades that are all the way down, but there's two or three that I don't. I have them up a little bit, or it's like, looks like they pulled it down but it didn't go all the way um, or I'll have one you know that goes up maybe halfway you can see the one in the upper left there that one's up a little higher so um, you can also print out and I tried printing out a picture of Venetian blinds and then printing it out on my printer and I use that material just to uh, do this and the the panel the the long panel in the center uh, I used a little material of Venetian blinds. So if you look really closely, and you kind of got to point this out to people because, you know, nobody's ever going to notice this. Uh, that window right there, that one's got a Venetian blind material, and it's got a little bit more gray on it. Um, and the rest of these are all <laughs> mini blinds. And that one is pulled down almost all the way. In one of the photos that I found, they had put newspaper over this window, so it probably looks like a crawl space because if you look at the look at the the height of that space, it's probably a storage area. It's probably not a full height area, um, so it's probably not a room. So they put newspaper over it just to close it off. Um, I went out and found some old newspaper and reduced it in size and printed it for that window. Um, it was really cool to do. It's really difficult to notice it. But um, you can kind of see that it looks different than the other windows. And it is covered with some other material. And you can see I've got uh, this window here is, um, it's got a, it's not quite closed all the way. So anyway, have fun with it. Put drapes in there if you want. You know, whatever. It's your kit. I'm not going to criticize you.
<laughs> so, all right, let's move on to the next step. Okay, so now we're going to assemble all of the um, outer walls and uh, glue them onto the inner walls. So there's an order that you put them in, put the ends um, in, and then the outside walls, the, uh, the long walls of the outer walls overlap. So you can see there's kind of a, an edge on the long wall that you can see where it abuts. That's fine because all that's going to get covered with trim, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, also, the uh, you can kind of see on the upstairs section, you'll notice that on the, um, I don't know how to explain this, the upstairs walls where you see the two windows on each side, that wall is actually thicker because I've braced it. I've put some additional material so that I have a bigger surface to glue the roof section onto. Um, it doesn't come with that piece of material. If you want to do it, you're going to have to grab some stuff and add it. Um, just grab some basswood. Um, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. It doesn't even have to be really good grade material because you're going to glue it on the inside and then you're going to glue the roof to it. I was just worried that I was going to have to run too fine a bead of glue down that um, that um, upstairs you know, triangular shape that it wasn't going to be big enough. It was going to be very narrow. So I was worried about that, and I wanted to make sure it was nice and solid. So make sure if you're going to do that, work around the windows. And if you're going to um, have a chimney that's coming down, that's sticking down, that you take that into consideration too, um, because some of the chimneys are actually going to come down along the inside of that wall. So you want to kind of plan for where the chimneys are going to go. Um, so we'll get to that in a second. So anyway, um, we got the walls, we got all the windows on, we got all the doors on, uh, there's some of the trim pieces that have been added, and now we have our, uh, our several wall sections uh, added. And you'll notice that the long wall section is actually in two pieces because that triangular piece actually uh, meshes with some recesses on the, the, that long wall, the two top windows. There's little notches that line it up so kind of a test fit and that's another thing I meant to mention this earlier test fit everything you're gonna do um, do it in advance make sure you know where stuff's gonna go and it's okay jump a couple of steps ahead you know they always say read the instructions all the way through well I think most people don't do that <laughs> but I know I've started doing it um, but it's definitely a good idea to do that for that reason because this building actually has a couple of sections that it's real easy to put the the upstairs windows in the wrong place you can see that the upstairs two windows on the uh, end that's only a single window so you don't want to mix those two up for sure so anyway test fit those test fit the sizes you're putting them together test fit the doors and windows before you peel the adhesive off just make sure everything looks good compare it to the the pictures and there's tons and tons of drawings for this thing and study the drawings really really well okay guys once more into the breach <laughs> we're gonna do the roof now so again take your time use whatever adhesive was working well for you on the sides and um, there's a lot of material that we're going to add and you can see all the alignment uh, grooves are actually laser cut um, just scribed lines that the laser has gone through and put um, just to get all of the, the roof um, ready so that when you put your piece of shingle down it's nice and straight you go to the next one you go to the next one take your time if you get a little weird on one of the lines you know you can take it off or you can you know either go over it or you know it's probably not going to be bad to have a little bit of variation in there anyway, but I try to keep mine dead on. So um, there's a lot of panels and a lot of uh, material that we have to add. And keep in mind that every time you add a row of shingles, the the width of it 
uh, half of it's going to get covered up by the next row. So start on the bottom, work your way up. When you get to the top, the goal is so that the uh, shingles, when they get to the top, you're probably going to trim off a little bit of the top piece because the goal is when the two pieces go together on the structure, we want to add a little piece of material, a uh, little piece of paper, uh, plastic, uh, wood, whatever, to, to create that top. In the instructions, it says use a thin piece of masking tape. Um, you want to make sure you can glue it on there uh, to create the very top crest of that roof, roof where those two panels meet. Uh, when I did this, my panels, um, the building was very square, so I didn't have a problem there. But this will be a place where you're going to have a problem if your structure is not completely square. Um, also, when you get the two panels meet, you know they're they're bored, so they have a thickness. And when you have the fit thickness, you're going to create a little void in that little notch where the two boards come together. So you may take a piece of material like I did, and just like a scale four by four material and just finish off that roof so that it actually comes to a nice clean point. So anyway, I did that, shingled up the sides, and then on the outside, I put another piece of material on top of it, an angled piece of material, and ran that all the way down. You could use a little piece of angled plastic or brass. Brass would be thinner, plastic would be a little bit thicker, depends on the look you want to go for. But anyway, that puts the cap on top. You could use just a thin piece of paper too. You could do that. Uh, the instructions, I believe it said uh, something about masking tape, but I wanted something a little more substantial, and I wanted to see that crest pop up a little bit too. In the, in the photos that I was studying, I saw that that, that that cap was a little more pronounced than a piece of masking tape might give me. So, But anyway, use what you think is going to look good or what's uh, easiest for you, and uh, muscle through. <laughs> I know I know this step isn't fun, but get it done and it's going to look great when you're finished. Okay, so this picture shows a really good view of the blocking that I added for supports, uh, just so that there's something more substantial to glue. Uh, you can see on the three uh, pieces of roof there that are added on the back side where the there's um, tabs where they're supposed to join together. Um, I did have to do a little trimming around the tabs to try to get them to mesh as tight as possible. Um, and you also want to make sure that the, the valley, the place where the two uh, roof sections come together, the, the valley section that goes down uh, that you can see leading away from us, uh, you want to make sure those are nice and tight. Uh, if you have to and your sections aren't really nice and tight, it's okay to fill in that void with something, fill it in with material, use a little bit of glue, um, you know, whatever you need to. Even if you have to get rid of some of the the um, texture, some of the surface of the shingles, because you'd rather have the shingles kind of fade away as far as the grooves in them, in that tight little spot, and you don't want a void in there. You don't want a, 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 a seam running down there. You'd rather have it just be like two panels running together seamlessly than having uh, a you know a crack that is exposed that you can see into the roof. So anyway, like I said, test fit everything. Uh, this is a really touchy place. Um, I would rather build ten of these structures if I didn't have to do the roof versus one if I had to do the roof again. So the roof is tough. This is a difficult part of the kit. So don't underestimate. Don't get in there and think, oh, I'm doing a horrible job. No, I did a horrible job, but it actually came out pretty good. So uh, just kind of hang in there. And uh, I will say that um, there is a few places of where there's gaps that I had that I had to touch up a little bit. If you look in the picture, the triangular panel on the right side, you can see one of the gaps that runs right down the valley between those two roof sections. Um, I came back and filled that in with material and to the point where it was flush with the two panels around it. Um, I did lose a little bit of texture, but you know, with weathering, and you're probably going to put a little bit more uh, weathering down the center uh, valley between those two roofs anyway, so it's probably not going to be as noticeable anyway. But um, this is a tough step, not to underestimate it. You thought shingling was hard. This part is very difficult. So take your time. Uh, if you got a nice square structure, 
should work out pretty well. Um, and you can see the benefit of having those blocks in place. I've, I have all that additional uh, material to glue to, but also I have that material that if I want to put clamps on it, I can clamp to that as well, where if I didn't put those in there, there wouldn't be anything to clamp to, just those thin edges on the sides. So um, it's definitely a good idea to add that. So. Okay, so let's talk about the funky part of the roof. <laughs> there is a overhang on the track side. You can see it in the top picture there. There's two doors that lead out to the tracks, and there's an overhang, a porch overhang, that covers just over those two doors. Kind of hangs over a little bit off on the right a little more as well. So you can see in this picture on the bottom, that's the panel that goes on the on the lower part of the roof and it has that funky extension that goes over the overhang goes over the doors they suggest that you take um, shingles and have it bleed upwards and kind of get it to curve but they also want the uh, um, that board to move when I did this I thought about I didn't really want to make any special cuts and r roll the roof on the blade like they had talked about so I found it much easier what I did was I shingled up the roof then I put a very thin piece of uh, material of basswood at the back side and you can see there's a little piece of basswood there and then I made a bead of glue a couple of different coats of it I think I did about three beads so as um, as I did it I did it so that the uh, glue was thin and then went up to the top and I just waited for the glue to dry and shrink and then I added another coat and then I just tailored it so that as the uh, bead of glue started it I left it thin and I just built it up until I got to the point where I got this natural curve because on the actual structure they have this weird line underneath those two windows on the top where this roof section actually goes at an angle and then curls upwards so there's this little bit of a curl in it so that's how I built that curl up and uh, you can shave the wood down a little bit you can get you know if you wanted to you could probably build this out of you know some cardstock or some balsa or something that's easier to carve I just built it up with a bead of glue and I kept wait doing it until I got the right thickness I think there was about three layers of glue okay so when you're done with that you're going to re-shingle right over that where that glue started you're going to re-shingle up over that um, incline that curved section and what you get is something that looks like this and again you can kind of test fit it to know what kind of height you want but mine came out so that the shingles went right up to the windowsill so um, you get this natural curve and it matches what the actual building looks like uh, this is a little tedious but it does capture the character of the actual building so if that's what you're after this is definitely worth taking the time to do and then when you're gonna paint the side the brown on the um, on the edge of that roof section you can paint it but when you get to the back side of it you're gonna get that kind of uh, uplift triangular kind of curved shape you can paint that so that it looks like that that's all edging and wood file it nice and flush and then paint it so that it look, you've got that curve to it it definitely uh, accents the fact that that roof has that funny shape to it. The other side uh, you're going to see as well because it's going to be built up over there too but it's it's pretty minor and it's it's um, not as easy to see as you can on this end but take the time to do it and it looks great when it's done. Okay so we are now um, at the point where the roof panels are on I've added, you can see down the valley on the front of the uh, track side there, you can see there's a little bit of glue uh, haze that I've added uh, a little bit to seal up that crack to make sure it's nice and tight when we're done. 
Um, and again, this is just for visual at once we start, uh, you know, painting it and sanding it and weathering it, um, it's going to uh, disappear. Uh, if we don't do this, you're going to have a crack there and you don't want to see that. Now, like we talked about the, uh, the top of the crest of the roof, uh, what I did is I had some plastic material and the photos that I saw of the very peak of this roof, it looked like there was almost like a, a ledge, like a bit of a lip on the very top for that uh, peak material. So it looked like it was overlapping uh, a bit rather than just putting a piece of, uh, you know, additional layer of shingles down or um, like masking tape or thin paper or something. I want something a little more substantial to kind of replicate what I was seeing in photos. So I used some evergreen uh, uh, channel stuff. It's just a 90 degree angle piece of plastic. It's not very big. It's really, really maybe a 16th of an inch on a side. So there's not much to it. Uh, this is also a good test to see how well you did on your roofing <laughs> by how much of a gap is around when you're adding it. So um, mine weren't perfect, but they were pretty close. So I was pretty happy with it, especially all the time that it took. Um, so the shingles are on. Uh, we got the crest material on the top of the roof. Uh, I glued this stuff on and um, I used pretty much the construction adhesive, but I added a couple of shots in little spots here and there of uh, super glue, just so I had two different kinds of uh, adhesive on there. I just want to make sure that uh, it doesn't peel off, uh, especially once we start painting it. So next step is to weather. So let's talk about weathering. So the weathering that I did was based on a couple different layers of a, uh, a base coat of paint. Um, and actually, I'll put all the steps in the instructions and in, in the comments of this, uh, this video. But uh, it's essentially it was a base color of paint, uh, a wash on top of that of a darker, thinner paint. And then I added uh, chalk dust, and I came back with a little bit of isopropyl alcohol with um, that 10 to 1 mix of uh, Indie ink and isopropyl alcohol. And but I at each layer I would pull off, I would pull away a little bit more. Like I would put the base coat on nice and solid, so I got really good coverage. Then I would put a wash on it that was kind of tinted the base coat darkened it a little bit for me, but I still had that, that splotchy look where it was unevenly washed on it. And then I used um, chalk dust and uh, a little less even. And uh, let's take a look at what kind of is the final result here. Okay, so what you're looking at is a layer of the uh, a, a base coat of paint and then um, I've added to that a wash of a slightly darker, similar paint. And these were two both craft paints that I found in the craft store. I usually don't use those, but I thought I was going to try it. I had seen some other modelers try those with some good effect. And it was a roof. I figured I could always cover it again, right? So after those two, the base coat and the wash, uh, then I went over and I did a little bit of uh, chalk dust. I used a black and a, and a dark brown in areas, in inconsistent areas, and you can kind of see where some of the browns and some of the blacks are. Um, I did a little heavier on the uh, edge of the roof because I wanted to show that that was the track side and we're going to get a little bit more residue. Um, one of the things I really struggled with was the color of the roof based on some of the photos that I had, and it looks like now, one of the structures up the track from this one was painted he really heavily with our good old friend, Mr. Oxide Red, again. And it's the coaling uh, pocket, the coal bunker. So um, it got heavily painted red oxide. It looked like the roof on this structure was painted red oxide at one point. And if, depending on the photos that you, look, you see of it, uh, it has varying amounts of the red oxide left on the roof. And um, so I wanted to simulate that, but I didn't want to cover the roof. And I could only see traces of it in some photos 
on the right section of roof where you can see the red oxide. So that's what I went after. Um, went through and with a very, very fine brush, it had a couple of bristles in it and that was it. And uh, went after, just did a few uh, spots and made it look like it was wearing. Um, but I didn't use any special uh, technique. I didn't use hairspray method. I didn't use the, the um, you know, the grains of salt and hairspray. Uh, I didn't do anything like that like I've done in some of the other videos. This was just me, a paintbrush, a very minute amount of paint, dry brushing on spots here and there to make it look like it was chipped and faded and had almost all of it peeled off. And all you can see is just what I can find in actual photos. So I try to mirror that and again I'm going for a certain age, certain year, so I'm trying to match the photos that I'm seeing. So anyway, long story short, um, so the paint is on, the paint is done, and at that point, do we like it? I don't know. Does everyone else have any input? I posted these out on my uh, Facebook group, HO Scale Tutorials, asked for comments, and a bunch of other sites that I knew uh, were some really talented artists. I posted them out there too. I put on my nice thick skin <laughs> and I waited for the comments to come in. So overall, I must say I was pleasantly surprised that there was nothing but really good comments. There was a few comments that thought I should go a little further or, um, you know, there's always, <laughs> if you ask for opinions, you're going to get them. So I asked for opinions. So, um, I got a few comments that, you know, I was like, okay, well, you know, maybe I could go a little heavier. So I, I don't know. So anyway, uh, this is what I ended up with, but I ended up with another round of really light India ink wash in a few spots. Okay. So like I said, after I got some input, um, I went back and I did add a little bit more weathering. You can see where the roof lip where the um, track side where the engines are going to move back and forth I added a little bit more variation a little bit more tone and a little bit more streaking on that just so it looked good um, I did there was a few spots on the roof that I wanted to make it not quite so uniform so I came back and did a little bit more but now I'm done because I did ask and everybody was like put the paintbrush down you're done put it on your layout so I stopped so now I'm done and uh, I do like that I did go back and add a little bit more. You'll also notice that uh, there's a chimney on this picture, and I added a little bit of weathering to come down from the chimney, the, any of the soot that would have washed off of it, and then it kind of came down into the, uh, the crevice a little bit. But um, I tried to hold back on making that go all the way down the roof. I didn't want it to go all the way down the valley. I wanted there to be a little bit of you know, where it looked like it had kind of aged a little bit. So anyway, that's the final roof. I'm not touching it. <laughs> I'm leaving it. I don't care how many positive or negative comments I got you know, going forward. Um, I like the way it looks, and I have to be happy with it. It's on my layout. So um, let's move on. Okay, so let's talk about the chimneys. Uh, chimneys are pretty simple, actually. Uh, it's one of the things I really do enjoy doing is brickwork, and I don't know why it just it always seems to work out really well uh, once you kind of get a, a habit, a technique uh, that you really enjoy. So um, I'm always pretty happy doing uh, brickwork. So and every material is different too. You handle plastic brickwork completely differently than you would, uh, you know, soft metal castings. So for this, it was very simple. Um, I shot it with a uh, coat of a brick uh, spray paint that I had. It was just a rattle can uh, color that um, I did for a base coat. It doesn't have to be pretty exact. You can go in and just paint it and uh, move on to the next step. Uh, if you want to, you can do a little variation on top of the bricks and choose different colors. If you do too much of that, it starts looking a little cartoonish and it doesn't look 
quite as normal and uniform as you would expect to see because most brickwork is pretty bland it's not a lot of you know variation they got all the bricks at the same time from the same factory generally and you know unless there's cracks or crevices or repair work or something like that you want to do you know just go with what you think it looks good so uh, again paint it go over it uh, after you get it painted um, oh let's start over prime the metal first and then uh, give it let it dry completely I usually let it dry overnight then paint it that base coat and then take a wash and there's a couple different ways you can do this to get the mortar color is you can um, you can thin some of the uh, this type of paint this acrylic uh, stuff and uh, paint it on there and sometimes if it's depending on the how um, detailed it is sometimes you can just wipe it off with your finger and everything inside that the crevices will stay um, sometimes you can take just a thin white um, or mortar colored um, paint and let it bleed into the cracks and then the problem with that is if it's really thin you're going to have to go back and do it a couple of times so what I did was primer paint uh, coat it with a uh, slightly thinned um, acrylic paint I rubbed it off in the areas that I wanted it to uh, you know the like the upper raised brick surfaces rubbed it off so all I saw was white in the cracks um, and then when I was done with that I went over and then I dry brushed some of that red back onto the um, uppermost portions of it after that uh, get some soot and some dirt uh, on top of the uh, you know the grime on top of the uh, the flue on top of the stack and then add a little bit and you can go way too overboard on this just add a little bit of it down the sides in a few spots here and there where it maybe is washed down um, the final uh, chimney actually looks a little bit different than this um, it's a little more soot because as I was adding it I wanted to add a little bit more soot that matched the uh, the stuff that was running off down the roof so it's a little more grimy than this but it essentially looks like the short one and again don't cut the uh, holes too late <laughs> like I did it was that was a huge mistake so anyway let's move on okay so the last step is for us to build this walkway around the back side of the structure and then the stairs that goes down so let me walk you through this real quick and uh, we'll talk about that you can while I'm here, I'm not sure how well you can see it, but there's the chimney on the back side. There's the chimney on the front side. They are different heights, obviously. So, and I got some some gunk coming down here, and on the front side, bleeding down off of there. Just a little variation and just an otherwise uniform roof just makes it look better all right so let's talk about the um, the back side the down slope side now don't don't forget this structure sits on a slope so the track side has the doors that come out and then there's a basement and then on the back side much like the two buildings next to it which are actually on stilts on the back side um, this this structure actually the ground drops away as it uh, moves down towards the creek so what we need to do is we need to add a little deck around there and then stairs that go down the back um, these are the parts that we're going to use so we'll go through these so upper left we've got two platforms uh, that's just the decking material that we're going to put on top beneath those is uh, two long boards that those two long boards go underneath the top decking material um, a whole bunch of uh, braces that go that build up uh, the uh, 
they're basically the joists, the spacers that go between. Um, and then the shorter uh, braces that go underneath the shorter decking material. So that's all you do to build the, the deck piece. Um, now there's stairs at the end, and then the lower right are the stringers, those kind of dragon teeth looking things. And then in the lower right is the uh, platforms, and those are each of the steps that get glued to the stringers. All right, so you pretty much build the box, put the decking material on top, build the other box, put the decking material on top, glue them together, and then uh, put the stairs on the end. Pretty simple. Um, also, there's supposed to be uh, a railing that goes along the top of the uh, that that uh, that decking material, and then legs underneath. You know, it's gonna be a lot easier if I just show you. <laughs> <clears throat> so you can see the decking material, you can see the stairs, the stringers and the steps. You can see the uh, the supports down here that are just made out of just um, you know basswood material. Roughly four by fours is what I scaled it to. And then uh, this here, the uh, the porch railing too. Now I made the porch railing come up to the height of just about the bottom of the window and uh, looking through some of the Rio Grande Southern Story books, uh, Mike Blazik drawings, also the drawings that are in the kit itself too, um, that's a roughly where the uh, the railing comes up to and if you figure a scale figure is going to stand on there the, the sizing looks right. If you have a figure just put it on there and if it looks right to you then that's a good height. Um, I had a couple of issues at this step, so let's go through that. Um, since the material that it was cut in, and this might have just been my kit, but since the material it was cut in was thicker than what it looked like it was supposed to be, the stringers for the stairs wouldn't slide into the slots in the stair assembly jig. So I just put a piece of painter's tape down on the workbench and I spaced them where they needed to be and pressed them into the painter's tape and lined them up so they were perfect and then uh, just glued the steps onto it. Um, and then when I was done, carefully peeled it off and then flipped it over and I did a little bit more reinforcement of glue underneath the steps just so that it, it wasn't going to move or snap or anything. So that got me the, the stairway. Um, the uh, the boxes under, that go underneath the decking material, since the material was thicker than um, what I think it was supposed to be, the uh, cross braces, the, uh, what are they? Uh, there's, let me see, there's 12 of those on the left, those 12 cross braces, they wouldn't fit cleanly into the, um, that, that box material. So I couldn't really build it, I, and, and it wouldn't fit into the laser cut hole. All I did was just take a file and just file a little bit off of each one, kind of make them more of a, a little bit more of a point, and then I could get them to seat all the way in. So, you know, um, it's easy to work around, but I just want, in case you start thinking, oh, what am I doing wrong? Um, uh, your material may go in and be thinner than what I had, and if that's the case, then you're not going to encounter any of these problems. Um, so anyway, I had to build the box, the two boxes, glue those together. I did uh, built the uh, stairway, and then when I got to glue the stairway into the L shape, there's that lone piece in the middle of the screen there that looks kind of like a, I don't know, a B. It's got the two square holes in it, and it's sitting all alone. That's where the stairs are supposed to glow into, and then there's supposed to be a slot in the side of the, in the. Let me use my structure again. Somewhere in here, there's supposed to be a slot where that the stairs goes into that piece, and then that piece gets glued onto the decking, and then it 
the, that slot, that peg goes straight into the wall. Well, rather than experiment and try to cut into my nicely painted wall, I scrapped that completely. I just glued the stairs on, uh, onto a piece of scrap basswood, the very top step, and it overhanged. So it did one of these. The top stair went up. The top, the top tread was like there, and the decking was here. I just put an oversized piece of block in here so that I have something to glue both surfaces together. So anyway, if yours works, then hey, great. If uh, it doesn't, then that was how I did a workaround. I got the uh, stairs and the decking material to mesh by just splicing a piece underneath that allowed me to latch the two. And again, I used um, the uh, Tight Bond 3 glue for all of this. And I got to tell you, uh, this is one of the strongest things that I've built, considering how flimsy everything looks. And uh, I kind of tugged at it a little bit. I'm not going to tug at it anymore because I know if I do, I'm going to break it. So anyway, um, uh, the type on glue stuff is great. So I built the whole thing and I didn't stain it beforehand. But I was very careful to make sure I didn't get any glue on any of the exposed surfaces. It would probably be better to stain it first. However, I didn't. And when I when I... Um, did get to staining it, I knew all I was going to do was just wash it with India ink. And if there was a section that maybe didn't get covered, I could just go a little heavier with a touch of India ink on it as well. So 90, uh, 90, um, what was it? 90 percent alcohol and it's uh, 10 parts India, 10 parts 90 uh, percent alcohol to one part India ink. And even then I sometimes go a little bit lighter because I'd like to be able to put more than one layer on if I want to, um, you know, add spots and wear areas and things like that. Um, so anyway, um, stain your stuff if you want beforehand. That's certainly the recommendation to do that. However, I didn't, so that's what I came up with. Okay, so now that it's all been assembled and given those uh, few caveats of some of the things that I ran into uh, that you may or may not encounter, um, it really, uh, each of the little things that I ran into uh, really didn't stop me at all from uh, completing uh, any of the sub assemblies of this. So you'll notice that the India ink wash is on here. Uh, I did paint the railing the same trim brown as everything else but I didn't paint anything else on this uh, entire assembly any other color I like the way it looked uh, I couldn't really tell what the prototype looked like other than it really didn't get any paint at all so um, I liked uh, the way that this accents the uh, you know contrasts with the just the bare weathered wood so anyway that's what it looks like um, You'll notice at the very bottom of the stairs, uh, I had three steps left over when I was done, which I think is normal. I think it's part of the kit. And I just added the three steps. I glued them together, put a piece of scrap underneath them, and then glued that underneath as kind of a little bit of a landing. But since it's probably going to lay on the ground, I made the boards uneven when they sat together. So uh, it looks a little more like just boards thrown down there. Um, the front of the building also has a, a little like a sidewalk but there are just three boards wide and it looks it matches the prototype where there was just some boards laid down on the ground just so that you wouldn't step off into uh, you know um, out of the door onto mud you would step off onto this little this uh, planking so anyway um, I stained that piece of planking uh, the same color as this, so everything matches. So when it gets all glued down to the uh, the layout, it's all going to uh, appear the same. One note about the legs. Uh, while I did glue the legs in, basically just up into the framing uh, underneath uh, where the decking is, you'll notice that some of them are a little, you know, not quite straight. Um, I just glued them in place, and I got them as straight as I could, but they are movable a little bit there's a little play in them and when I get this building ready to put down I'm gonna 
just you know put marks where I want each of the legs to go and then I'm going to drop the structure into place and the legs are all going to go down into these holes and they'll straighten out then. <clears throat> the one that's on the farthest right, that one is probably going to be almost completely buried in a hole because the ground line is going to go from that edge of the railing and it's going to go from there down to this lower section in the very corner of the uh, decking. So that being the case, that top one is probably going to be completely buried and you probably won't be able to see it all. The next couple will just slowly get more and more exposed. So um, that's what it looks like. Let's take a look at the uh, finished product. Okay, so this is it. Um, we're done. <laughs> and I'm so glad to be able to say that too. We are done. Um, the decking has been glued onto the side and all I really did was I used some um, tight bond 3 glue I put on the a little bead down the edge right where the yellow met the oxide red and I, and I put the decking onto it and I glued one side on and then I kind of pried uh, the other side up once one side was dry I didn't try to do glue both sides at the same time so I kinda pried it just up a little bit to expose it, put a little bit more on there, clamp that in place, and uh, it's on there. It's solid. So it's ready to be added to the layout. We're going to put this. Uh, this structure is going to look great with the rest of the um, advanced junction structures that we've completed in earlier videos. And uh, other than that, that's it. Let's, uh, you know what, before we... Uh, Stop. Let's take a look at the other side too, because then you can see the front of it. All right, there we go. So that's the front side of it. You can see the curve of that. Um, one thing I didn't mention was underneath that curved porch area, there are two little braces underneath that go on there. And um, you can see where all the uh, trim pieces are painted and glued in place. And uh, the corner of trim, that's just. Uh, material that comes in the kit so uh, that's what it looks like now that red front basement section that's buried that's the basement and the two doors walk out onto track level onto the um, the little planking that comes with the kit so that's the finished product and we are done and I appreciate you guys sticking with me through this video if you made it to the end Good job. I hope you have, if you did make it to the end and you're thinking about uh, buying this kit and building it, um, it was it was not an easy kit. I would say that um, it's just four walls and a roof. That's what it sounds like. It sounds like it's simple, but there is a lot of complexity to it, but it's a lot of fun. I enjoyed building this kit. There's another kit that is like this um, that uh, the company also makes. And uh, I'm looking forward to that, but I've got a bunch of stuff to do first. Uh, we're going to, our next uh, construction kit is going to be the depot. So if you see the, uh, the stuff there in the, uh, the small picture on the top, the art from left to right, it goes RPO baggage, boxcar, standard gauge boxcar, by the way, section house. All three of those are done. So the next thing is the depot, which is an old passenger car which I believe was a wrecked passenger car. And um, it is sitting on the ground, although since it's on the same slope with all the all of the, uh, the earth um, moving down towards the creek bed, the back side of it's on stilts. And the front side of it is um, right at ground level, at track level. So um, that's our next project. So we'll, we'll get into that when we're ready. Um, so we still have that one to go. So we've built those three. We built that little speeder shed up the track. And then uh, down towards Telluride, we also built a trestle. And uh, the last project, for as far as structures go, before we start laying track, is the coaling pocket. And that one's going to be completely scratch built because um, I have only, no, only know of one kit for that. And that kit's 
really hard to find and if you do find it it's going to be outrageously expensive so I got plans from uh, Mike Blazek for the coaling pocket and we're going to build that one from scratch that one's going to be a project that one may be more than one uh, project because there's uh, different parts to that uh, kit so uh, or that that project because there's a little uh, coaling bin on the back there's how the section was graded anyway um, thanks you guys for watching this episode thanks for subscribing and uh, feel free to reach out to me on the HF scale tutorials uh, Facebook group and I looked earlier this evening and we were three uh, members to the HO scale tutorials group um, away from 2000 we started that group eight months ago and it's really just kind of taken on a life of its own so again thanks for you you guys for watching and uh, our next episode part seven will be the um, passenger car as you can see in the upper right in that tiny little picture on the top so thanks again to Bill Banta I appreciate uh, your help. Thanks again to the friends of Converse and Toltec. Uh, you guys have been awesome. I really appreciate being able to feature photos of the actual prototype. So we don't just look at a kit. We actually look at a kit in the environment where it's supposed to be. So I uh, look forward to uh, talking to you guys in part seven of the uh, Vance Junction series. Thanks and take care.